Officials from TEPCO visited Niigata and spoke to a local panel of experts. They tried to win their support for the restart, a condition for putting the reactors back online. But they got a frosty reception. The officials revealed last month that they had, if, had they followed their in-house manual, they should have announced the Fukushima reactors were in meltdown much earlier. Niigata government set up a panel of experts to study TEPCO's handling of the 2011 accident. One of the topics was the delayed announcements. We should have known about and reported the existence of the manual sooner. We failed to do that. And so again, I must apologize. For five years, you continued to say there was no standard for determining when a meltdown occurs. How can we trust you? How can we let your company restart the nuclear plant? The panel will continue their probe. The Tokyo District Court has begun hearing arguments in a lawsuit over a prototype nuclear reactor in central Japan. Residents are demanding that the nuclear regulator cancel an installation permit for the facility. The reactor was designed to use reprocessed nuclear fuel from other power plants, but it has sat mostly idle since an accident in 1995. Some 100 residents want to shut the plant permanently. They say the reactor's operator, the Japan Atomic Energy Agency, is incompetent. They say the plant could suffer a serious accident in the event of an earthquake or tsunami. One of the plaintiffs said in the court that the government's nuclear fuel recycling program has failed. The government countered that the dangers claimed by the plaintiffs are abstract and that no risk of grave damage to the plaintiffs could be found. It asked the court to dismiss the case. The nuclear uh, regulator asked the science minister last November to replace the reactor's operator, citing lax safety management. A ministry panel is discussing Japan the is loading plutonium onto a ship to be transported to the U.S. under a bilateral agreement. The ship will carry 331 kilograms of pure plutonium, believed to be enough to make 40 atomic bombs. The transfer is part of counterterrorism measures agreed upon by Japan and the U.S. at a nuclear security summit in 2014. Japan originally purchased the plutonium from some Western countries in the 1970s. It has been used for research purposes. The Japanese government has not disclosed the route of transport, citing security reasons. On Monday, an armed British registered ship arrived at a port in Ibaraki Prefecture. The cargo, carrying the mark of nuclear materials, was loaded on Tuesday. Experts say the purity of the plutonium is so high it could easily be used in nuclear weapons. The material will be processed at a facility in the U.S. to prevent such use. Other than the shipment, Japan has 47 tons of plutonium produced through reprocessing spent nuclear fuel. Japan had plans to use the stockpile in a fast-breed reactor that burns plutonium. 
but the reactor is still under development. Japan's nuclear regulator has decided to suspend the restart process for two nuclear reactors in the center of the country. Work was underway at the number six and seven reactors at the Kashiwazaki Kariwa plant in Niigata. But officials now say that the plant operator, Tokyo Electric Power Company, has failed to provide enough information to screen its level of quake resistance. Initially, officials at the Nuclear Regulation Authority had given priority to assessing both reactors for a restart. The reactors are the same type as those at the crippled Fukushima Daiichi plant. Niigata Governor Hirohiko Izumira said he hopes that the nuclear regulator will thoroughly check the plant's problems. He also said not enough is understood about the cause of the 2011 Fukushima accident to prevent a recurrence. Well, Japan's reactors must meet the government requirements introduced after the nuclear accident before going back online. A new giant arch intended to contain the remaining radioactive materials at the site of the nuclear disaster in Chernobyl, Ukraine, has been shown to reporters. The 30th anniversary of the Chernobyl accident is approaching. On April 26, 1986, a reactor undergoing a test run exploded, releasing massive amounts of radioactive materials into the atmosphere. The reactor was uncovered, or rather was covered, with a concrete and metal sarcophagus. The concern is growing that radioactive substances may leak from the aging shield. The European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, or EBRD, has administered the financing of the arch. The structure will be about 100 meters tall and more than 250 meters wide. It will be moved to the accident site some 300 meters away by the end of the year, ahead of its scheduled completion next year. The arch will cost more than $1.5 billion. It's expected to confine the radioactive materials for 100 years. On the one hand, uh, handle huge structure elements of the, of, the, of the old sarcophagus, at the same time has the capability to deal with the high precision operations needed for, for, for waste management. So these are key, key elements. But the cleanup work is not expected to be easy as radiation levels at the site remain high. More than five years since the Great East Japan earthquake of 2011, the rebuilding process continues. On top of repairing and replacing physical losses, there are also spiritual needs. So a new movement is answering the call by bringing clergy of different faiths together to offer support. NHK Rosatsuko Iwasaki reports. <laughs> This cafe opened in late February at a temporary housing facility in Ishinomaki. <laughs> All of the staff members are Christian ministers or Buddhist priests. <laughs> they meet with disaster survivors in places like this to offer spiritual support. でもなんかもしわけないよね、おばさんとお父さんの2人だけ置いて自分だけ助かったっていう追い目っていうか、お父さん恨んでるのかなとかって余計なこと考えるわ。まあ、でも無理はないでしょうね。こう、ご自分の
Soon after, Kaneta met with Takeshi Okabe, a doctor who had been providing palliative care to terminally ill patients for many years. Dr. Okabe said that he needed priests like Kaneta to offer spiritual support to disaster survivors and terminally ill people. Dr. Okabe died of cancer in 2012, just after Kaneta and his colleagues founded the program at Tohoku University to train chaplains of multiple faiths. Now, Buddhist, Christian, Muslim, and Shinto graduates all meet together to study each other's religion. These interfaith chaplains have visited the devastated areas together to pray. And they've undergone training on how to counsel survivors. The chaplains have been working with medical and welfare specialists to comfort people who are grieving and the terminally ill. So far, nearly 130 people have completed the training program. The movement to train interfaith chaplains is starting to spread across the country. An organization promoting their mission in Japan was founded in late February. Demand for their services is growing, not only in the devastated areas, but also at hospices and nursing homes elsewhere. When organizations like this are established, there is a tendency to lose the religious dynamic or exclude outsiders. Whenever that possibility arises, we must return our minds to the shore and remember our emotions on that fateful day. Too often, religion is used as a way to separate people. But members of this dedicated group are trying to understand their differences and overcome them to better serve people in need. Atsuko Iwasaki, NHK World. Events in Belgium showcasing performing art traditions from areas hit by the March 2011 disaster in Japan have been called off after Tuesday's attacks. The events this week were to bring together groups from the Tohoku region in Japan's northeast. Organizers included the Japan Foundation. Among the performers were 10 members of the Shishi Odori Deer Dance Group based in Hanamaki City, Iwate Prefecture. The troupe was to leave for Belgium from Narita Airport near Tokyo on Wednesday, but returned to Hanamaki. I saw what happened in Belgium and I feel disturbed at learning about the situation there. Kamikawa says she's disappointed because she wanted to express appreciation for the support that Tohoku people received from abroad in the aftermath of the 2011 disaster. On March 11, 2011, a massive earthquake hit northeastern Japan. It triggered a huge tsunami that washed away entire communities and caused one of the worst nuclear accidents in history. This week, our series Journey from Disaster will look at the region and its people five years on. In this installment, Refashioning the Future. The nuclear accident has raised concerns over the safety of products from Fukushima. A local fabric manufacturer is working to rebrand his business and restore consumer confidence. NHK World's Tomoko Kamata reports. Shibuya, one of Tokyo's fashion hubs. Shoppers here are always on the hunt for what's new. The vivid colors and modern designs of this new knitwear line are luring them in. This looks cool. I want this. It's fashionable. A label with a big story to tell. Making knit products has been one of the key industries of Fukushima Prefecture. Dozens of factories operate in this city of Date, and these products were produced at this factory. Seiju Ro Mishina runs the knitwear company Daisan. He has been producing fabrics for other clothing companies for over four decades. He made efforts to reflect their designs exactly as they ordered. But that unraveled after the 2011 nuclear disaster. 
Some clients asked us to check the radiation levels of the products before shipping. We had to do so as long as it was required. Although the items were safe, many clients shied away from Fukushima products. And one by one, local factories were forced to close down. Mishina thought it was time to change his business model and create an original brand. I thought I could no longer run the company if I just sat here and kept waiting, so I decided to take action. Mishina started looking for a retailer who would take it on. He met his business partner, Mika Sato, an executive of a Shibuya-based boutique group. Her hometown is near the Fukushima nuclear plant. She was an advisor on a reconstruction panel. So it wasn't hard to weave herself into Mishina's dream. We agreed to create a new brand image for Fukushima. That is a vision of people standing up from the disaster and overcoming the difficulty. Young employees in Mishina's factory spearheaded the project. Their biggest challenge was finding the best mix of colors. They doubled the number of colors of the traditional items to knit complicated designs. And they used their computer graphic skills. They simulated thousands of colors to pick the best yarn combinations. After two and a half years of trial and error, the factory released its first brand, Nijiro Camp, meaning a rainbow-colored canvas. We feel more responsibility when selling products we make from scratch. That's a big difference compared to the time we were just taking orders. Last month, Mishina and his staff took part in a fashion convention in Tokyo. Many buyers rushed to the booth to get first dibs. Sato also stopped by to look at the latest items. There are 30 different colored squares. Fantastic! Your factory can create such high quality. I'm receiving many offers to take our brand abroad. I want to sell our made in Fukushima goods in many countries so that we can change the image of Fukushima into a positive one. Mishina says the adversity of the disaster gave them strength to take on a new frontier and create pride among people in Fukushima. Tomoko Kamata, NHK World.